right. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you to the Shadow and Museum for having me. I always love being here. I've done a few different talks. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll try to project. <laughs> um, I've done a few different talks here before and always enjoy coming back. So tonight we're talking just briefly about Ozark folk healing traditions and folk magic traditions, specifically focusing on items that I've brought in for the Ozark home today. Um, so we're going to be looking through these items as well as some of the paper items on the back. And we're going to be kind of situating these things within the tradition of Ozark folk healing. But before we talk about the details, I really always like to give a little bit of an overview to situate people in case you don't know all the words that I say right now. So when we talk about the Ozarks, we are in the Ozarks right now. Um, the Ozarks extend up to Missouri, down you know, south of us in Arkansas. It actually goes over into Oklahoma and Kansas as well. Uh, culturally speaking, the Ozarks extends even farther than that. There's Ozark culture in the River Valley, Ozark culture in the Washita's, Illinois. And so if you are from an Ozark family, you might recognize some of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. And you might not either, because some of these traditions, a lot of these traditions, were family-based. So some families passed things down, some families didn't. And so I hope that you can all come with me on this Ozark journey and maybe take some pieces of this with you out into the world and your interactions with the land here, as well as your interactions with your own Ozark family. I always encourage people at the beginning of all of my talks to talk to your elders, talk to the people in your lives that were, you know, might have stories, or if you are somebody who has stories and remedies and recipes and things like that, write them down, record them. You know, there's lots of good technology now that is good for this sort of thing. So. Always, always, always record it and write down everything before it's too late. Um, and you know, this has happened in my family specifically. You know that that it's a, it's too late now. Always comes too quickly. And so I think you know, Shadow Museum would agree with me to record everything and jot down everything. We were talking earlier before the talk. But, you know, keep. I always tell people keep family Bibles and cookbooks. These are the uh, Ozark repositories for a lot of really interesting and really good information. Um, so if you have these things in life or you know, stories, things like that, you are a folklorist, even though you may not think you have the training for it. We are all folklorists. We are all involved in this process. So you know, those are mountains. You know, um, the traditions that we're looking at here mostly come from Appalachia originally. So if you are from Appalachia or have connections to Appalachia, you will definitely recognize a lot of what we're talking about. Um, because the settlers to the area after the indigenous people were removed were the, oh, from Appalachia <laughs> um, to the Ozarks. And so there are, is a long lineage of <coughs> cultural connection going back to Europe. We have a lot of even indigenous practices that were incorporated in, in Appalachia. We have West African and Central African practices that were incorporated in as well. Um, and so I, I, I always tell people, you know, even if you don't think you have these traditions in your family, you do. <laughs> we all do. We all have them. And they are so much deeper and they're so much more interesting than we ever give them credit. Um, my own interest in all of this came in college uh, when I took a folklore class and we talked about Ozark folklore. And that was the first time that I was really able to recognize that my family was doing, you know, weird things <laughs> that wasn't just my family doing this. So, you know, this connection to this wider culture that we have here. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times we overlook family traditions, we overlook traditions, uh, you know, as just being, oh, the things that our family did, or oh, the things that so-and-so did. But this is all a part of this big tapestry of practice. And when you start piecing together all of these stories, when instead of just talking to one family, you start talking to 10, 20, 30 families, you really get a, a broad picture of a, a practice of a folk healing tradition. It's not just little bits and pieces anymore, little remedies here and there. It is an actual grounded 
worldview is an actual grounded work in and of itself. And the keepers of this work traditionally have been the healers. And, you know, in the old days, they, they went by a lot of different names. Granny women, I think, is one of the most recognizable terms. A lot of these we don't use today. They've kind of fallen out of fashion, but you might hear them in the stories, uh, fireside stories, things like that, but a lot of these terms we don't really use anymore. But you had the granny women who were mostly midwives, but, um, you know, that's what the folklore so he said. Uh, the reality of the, the granny woman was she was the all-encompassing source of a lot of medical knowledge for rural communities before country doctors came into the area. And even when country doctors came into the area, um, people preferred the granny women who oftentimes had much more uh, working knowledge <laughs> of the body and plants and healing methods than even the doctors had. So the granny women were really important for the community. They held not only the herbal knowledge and the physical remedy knowledge, but they also held a lot of the, what we might call non-physical non, uh, medicine practices. So faith healing practices, charms, spells, things like that, or what we would call spell today. Um, so the granny woman was a real important figure in the community. You had the Yarb doctor who worked with Yarb, which is an Ozark dialect word for a medicinal plant or an herb. Um, there's lots of theories about the uh, origin of that word, but no one can really say for sure uh, where it comes from. But the Yarb doctor specifically worked with plant medicines, was an herbalist. But what we see with Ozark traditional healing is that not only were physical medicines used, but these non-physical medicines were also as important to the healing process as the plants. So even we had herbalists, you, know, you would have herbal healers who would pray over their medicines. You would have herbal healers who used certain spoons because they were made out of wood that was inherently better than other types of wood for medicinal plants, specifically. You had healers who would have verbal charms or prayers and things that they would say when they were harvesting plants, where they had some sort of, you know, what we might call a supernatural connection to the land um, as a part of their practice itself. And so throughout all of these sort of healing traditions, you know, today as folklorists, we divide up these practices into, you know, physical medicines versus faith medicines. But, you know, in the old days, all of these things would have been connected together. And the reason I bring up this sort of non-physical medicines is that is what's in this case. <laughs> These are all representative of non-physical medicines. So nothing in this case is ingested as we would call, you know, as we would take medicine today. But all of this was equally as important to the healing process. And over the years, you know, with, with modern medicine that has come into areas, with just the modernization of the Ozarks in general, We've lost a connection between what the old timers would call medicines for the body and medicines for the soul, or for the mind, we might say today, or for the spirit, whatever, however you want to refer to that. There's a disconnect today. And traditionally, you know, and I'm going to be referring to traditional in a lot, a lot in this talk. What I mean by traditional is we're, we're talking pre 1950 back to settlement and around 1810. Um, this was, you know, the time period that folklore like Ben Randolph and Mary Carter were really collecting a lot of information from. We have more information from this time period. Medicine was more important for these generations. This is a tradition that was born out of necessity, it was born out of survival. You know, what do you do when you're in the woods and you don't have any medical care around? You develop your own medicine. And so when I refer to traditional medicines, it's not to say that the traditional medicines are gone today. They're not. They've changed. They've evolved. They're harder to find in some cases, but in other cases, the heart of the practice, the heart of the, the folk tradition is still here, just maybe looks a little bit different. But when I refer to traditional practices, I'm referring to this, this older time period and what was more common during this time period. 
So for traditional traditional healers, there was no separation between healing the body and healing the soul, healing the spirit. They went hand in hand. If your soul was sick, your body got sick. If your body got sick, your soul got sick. These were intimately linked together, and we know this today. I mean, there have been medical researchers that have done you know, a lot of research into the psychological effects of illnesses. And so we can even cite that you know, traditional healers in their own way were sort of folk psychologists along with these med medicine keepers. And so traditional healers would address both parts of the body system in very specific ways. So the body, the physical body, they may address with physical medicine, whether that's medicine gathered from the land or grown or later on gathered from the pharmacy. So repurposing pharmaceuticals, uh, I don't know if anybody grew up using Vicks for everything, but repurposing Vicks and things like that, repurposing, you know, the older Older sort of style was repurposing things like camphor, resin, and turpentine, and all of these sort of products that you couldn't really make at home. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, these plants didn't even grow here. Camphor is from Southeast Asia, but the pharmacy, the pharmacy became sort of the hub for both the country doctors as well as for the traditional healers. They would come as well. And so addressing the physical symptoms of the body was these physical medicines. And addressing the spirit or the mind or the soul of the person took a lot of different forms. Sometimes it involves faith healing or what we might call sort of supernatural healing, um, using plants and objects and things like that, uh, things like what we're going to look at in the case, not for an internal medicine, but as part of a healing ritual or a healing process uh, because the mind works on the body as well. And so if you're able to engage a person using certain symbols or certain rituals, you can engage them better in their own healing process. A huge part of the healing work that traditionalists did and that is still preserved today and part of the work I do is getting people to start doing this again is focusing on the care of the patient. So the care of the person that they're working with. And so what does that look like? You know, traditionally healers would live with the patients. So they would take care of the house. And, you know, if it was a, a mother who was sick, they would walk after the kids. Uh, they would make sure that they, there was food on the table. If it was the, the dad who was sick, you know, they, they might call in somebody to help chop wood or they might chop wood themselves. You know, so there's this, this community aspect to the healing process amongst the sort of traditionalists. This idea that allowing a person to fully engage with their own healing process sometimes means taking care of everything with them so that they don't have to worry about this stuff, they can just engage. And another dimension that this took on was, you know, making a person comfortable. And in the Ozarks, specifically, I mean, people weren't really thinking, you know, what sort of cultural ritual can I do to make this person feel comfortable? No, what, what would they do? They would take care of the house, they would sit and they would pray with the person, they would read the Bible with the person, or sing some songs with the person, to engage them in all of these sort of rituals that we don't think are really rituals, but all of these things that really would make the person comfortable and ease that healing process. And so ritual itself is a very important part of the traditional healing process, even though, you know, a lot of the rituals, people just say, oh, well, that's just what you do when you make a healing broth. You know, I had uh, one of my teachers who would have considered herself a teacher, but she was a teacher to me. She was a, a fantastic herbalist. And I asked her one day if there was any ritual that she did when she was making teas and stuff. And she, oh, I don't do anything. But then we made it an herb broth, uh, you know, for some sick people that she knew. And she had uh, a spoon, a specific spoon that was, had red cedar handle and an oak bowl, and it had three little crosses burned into it. 
And when she blessed her medicine, she always stirred it clockwise three times and counterclockwise three times, and she crossed it three times. Then she read some psalms over it, and then and when she bottled it, she gathered up all the bottles on the kitchen table, and she would lay hands on it, and she would pray it, and she would anoint each of the bottles with oil. And so by the end of all of this process, you know, we, we went back and we kind of talked about what was going on. And I asked her, I said, you know, you don't think this is a ritual. You don't consider this to be a ritual? And her exact words, and it's what I always tell people when they ask me about my weird rituals, no, it's just what you do when you're making yard bras. <laughs> what do you do? And so that is, that is sort of uh, the heart of a lot of Ozark cult practice. It's just what you do. Um, traditionalists, you know, back in the, the old, old days, um, still today, people, you know, plant by the signs and things like that, using, you know, farmer's almanacs, but still, you know, print all of this sort of moon phases and zodiac information, all this. Ozarkers, at one point, were obsessed with auspiciousness. You know, obsessed with making sure everything, it's like a watch, you know, like the old uh, winding watches, you know, you've got to make sure all the little gears are in place in order for the watch to work. And that's the same thing with auspiciousness. It's, you, you know, you you uh, get rid of warts during the waning moon, uh, because as the moon's light grows darker, the, the wart will disappear. You know, it will grow smaller and smaller and smaller. It's all working within these natural sort of systems. But if you were to ask anybody that actually works with this stuff, if they thought it was magical or anything like that, they would say, no, it's just what you do. You want to heal warts, you don't heal warts, warts during the waxing moon because the warts will grow bigger. You heal them during the waning moon. And so it's the same thing with all of what we call today sort of faith healing or folk magic or all of this other stuff that, you know, academics, all these words that academics like to label. You know, for, for Ozarkers, it was just sort of what you did to address specific illness at that time, and it's just, you know, what you did um, to, to formulate the medicine. And so, ritual. For me, one of the lost parts of Ozark cult healing today is that other side of the healing process. We've got the physical cover. For the most part, we've got the physical cover. I know a lot of herbalists and people are getting more and more interested in you know, what plants we can gather from the land, medicinal plants, how to use them, things like that. But we've lost this engagement with the other side of the healing process. We've lost this sort of soul of the practice, this part of the practice, in my opinion. Um, and traditional healers today even are trying to sort of combat that. Um, in, in interesting ways, too, I met a lady who was, at the time, in her 80s, well-known healer in her community, and at some point in the past, she shifted in her practice, which is a very Ozark way of working. You know, Ozark, you know, people outside the Ozarks think that we are, you know, very stubborn and, you know, very bullheaded, but healers, anyway, are very willing to change with the times in order to address the community in order to address the people that they are healing. And so this woman, at some point in the past, her sole practice that she did was people would go to the doctor in town. She and the doctor had a very good relationship. He didn't butt in with her stuff. She didn't butt in with his stuff. She, people would go to the doctor. They would get prescription medicines. They would get diagnoses, things like that. They would bring them to her, and she would pray over them. And that's all that she did. But she would take them and she would pray over them and then give them back. And people swore that the medicines were more effective because of this process. So this sort of other side of the healing work doesn't have to be something that interrupts the actual medicine that is working. It's not something that has to interrupt the medical process that is working. It is something that can work and integrate with it, um, which is a, the traditional way of working. You know, people in the past weren't averse to medicine. They just understood that there were two sides of the healing process. And you can't just address the physical without addressing everything else, without addressing everything in your body, 
without addressing nutrition and what all of that stuff is housed. Magical medicines before I ramble into uh, a dark place in the world. But I'll be back. Um, so the, the ritual side of the healing process often focus on utilizing the auspiciousness in nature. And auspiciousness means you can say luckiness, um, you know, and aus adding auspiciousness to a situation means that you're giving that situation the best possible outcome. So in the healing process, you want what you're doing to work. And so by adding auspiciousness, by you know stirring the medicine a certain amount of times, by picking plants at specific times, picking aerial portions of the plant in the light of the moon and roots in the dark of the moon, you are giving the medicine the best possible outcome. Hopefully. And as a part of that, auspicious parts of nature could be brought in with the heat. Sense. Healers are very clever. They're very cunning in this. They're able to, in some cases, sense auspiciousness out of the world or by nature of the learning process and what you know the rituals and things that they've passed, they're they're able to know what is good for certain situations. So for instance, a black chicken feather bird. So Black chickens in particular, and you may not have known this, but they can pick up illnesses without dying from the illnesses themselves. So that's what the traditions tell us. So a broom like this made from black chicken feathers could then be used in a sweeping ritual. So we might give a person some medicines and then take a broom like this, sweep down the body. A lot of this healing process was involved with what folklore is called sympathy, which means that you are recreating commonplace rituals in the home. You're repurposing them for a healing purpose. So just like you can take a broom and sweep dirt out of your house, you can take that broom, and if you know how to use it in the right way, you can sweep a person clean of your illnesses. And so feather brooms were pretty common, black chicken feathers in particular, because the idea is that the black chicken can absorb this illness and then it doesn't stay on the, the actual broom. There are also disposable brooms or brooms that are then burned at the end of the healing session. Um, in this case, this wouldn't have to be burned. So those are good for always looking for things that they could repurpose. You never burn your regular broom if <laughs> you, you know, go gather dead herb stalks and things, or you have items that you can keep using as part of the healing process. So you'll notice a lot of what is in this case is from nature itself. And by, by the nature of how certain things are formed, we can identify those things as being auspicious. Uh, auspiciousness in nature usually has a rarity to it or an unusualness to it. So, for instance, um, sticks or branches that are shaped in specific ways. So, I have a snake stick or a dragon stick in the back um, that was given to me, and it's, it's a root that is formed in the shape of kind of a snake head or a dragon head. And so, the idea being that you can connect to the sort of traditional association for the snake and those are folklore snakes are sometimes associated with illnesses, taking out the illnesses from the body. There are other auspicious uh, things to hold objects. Um, so on this side of the case, these are objects that have naturally occurring holes through them. So I don't know if you've ever been on the creek side and picked up a hole stone. It's a stone that just has a hole straight through it. Um, sometimes they're called hag stones, adder stones, blood for them, um, but those are typically just called the pole stones. This is, these are auspicious objects because nobody formed that hole, it formed naturally, and when you go out onto the creek, you know, you don't normally just find everywhere you are. Um, we know that they, these things form naturally, but by nature of the unusualness of these objects, they add auspiciousness. So, for instance, pole objects, 
can be used as a part of blessing rituals for liquid medicines. Um, I met uh, one of the holes down the this side. Um, I met a guy. He gave he had a bunch of them, but he gave me one of his. And every morning he would pour spring water through the hole into a glass and drink for his health. Um, so it's this idea of the the blessing comes from the contact between liquid medicine and this naturally occurring hole. Um, in some folk legends, these naturally occurring holes are uh, entryways into the other world. So if you're in the woods and you see a tree with a big naturally occurring hole and don't crawl through it, because uh, you might get whisked away by the little people. Uh, but these were also used by healers because part of uh, why a healer is a healer is a healer knows things that other people don't. Um, and one common way of referring to healers in the community was, you know, you wouldn't say, go see the healer down the road. You would say, go see so-and-so, they know things. Or go see so-and-so, they have the sight, which is another sort of way of referring to them. They can see things that other people can't, know things that other people don't. And as a part of this, you know, healers know when to use certain things and when not to use it. So, for instance, you know, I just said don't step through holes and trees, but I met a healer who uh, called a babies. She would pass through a hole in the tree out in her backyard um, as a way of healing. And then the passing action through the hole, it would basically take the illness off and leave it behind. Um, but a healer knows how to do that, whereas the lay person doesn't necessarily. But other whole objects, there's a whole root um, that I, I used in blessing medicines for quite a while. Just put it over whatever cup or receptacle and pour the medicine through it as a blessing. Also, bones that have naturally occurring holes, specifically pelvic bones. Um, it's this you know, unbroken circle. There, there's no, there's that's that's sort of the auspiciousness of it. It's, it's not. It's set in, in the object without any openings. Other sort of natural things that pop up in Ozark folk healing include specific plants used for specific purposes. So, green briar, for instance, green briar used in scratching rituals, um, which probably has an indigenous origin, likely. Um, so, this was before the hypodermic needle. I mean, you go to a, a yard doctor and they would take a the green briar and they'd scratch up in your skin and then rub medicine to it. Um, and so used for that, but then also used symbolically as well. And so used for protection, hanging green briar or above your doorway. Have green briar growing on the land, cut some and put it above your doorway. Uh, it's this idea of the, the actual thorns will symbolically protect. House from the thing that tries to in. Three pronged branches um, have light. I've heard different reasons for why these things are auspicious. Um, most people connected to the idea of eternity, sacred for free or the cross. Um, but red cedar is a very common tree that grows here, um, but it's probably the most widely used plant in Ozark folk healing. Uh, for its purifying quality and its cleansing quality, uh, but also its protective quality. So this is a three-pronged red cedar stake that could be staked outside of the house as a sort of protective thing. And transitioning over to amulets, you know, the healing process wasn't always just about healing the sickness. Now, sometimes it was about preventing the illness from coming back or preventing it from attacking altogether. And this is the case of amulets, the most famous being the buckeye. Anybody carrying the buckeye? That's the best. It's no, no buckeye carriers. So at one point, you know, it was hard to find it was our if we didn't have the buckeye nuts on there. Um, buckeye nuts are a panacea, so it's a cure-all. Uh, I've heard rheumatism protects from arthritis, protects from all sorts of illnesses. In the old days, Vance Randolph collected some, a lot of stories about how people said, thought it protected against STDs. So, uh, throwing that out. Um, 
None of these things are medically verified, of course. Um, but it can also protect from all those sort of supernatural things. It can protect against curses. You know, you maybe your neighbor is upset at you and um, throws a curse at you or something like that. The Buckeye Nut is a sort of all purpose amulet for that purpose. Uh, but it can also be given to a patient after a healing process, maybe with some blessing or some prayers said over it, um, as a way of sort of bolstering the, the person now that they're not around the healer or not in contact with the healer. Um, other things, you know, a, a, there's a boar tusk here, um, pig's teeth in general, but the boar tusk specifically worn to protect against toothaches. So again, going back to this idea of sympathy, connecting symbolically to the natural world. So the boar's tusk is strong, pig's teeth are strong. So by wearing these objects, we are able to then sort of protect our own teeth, strengthen our own teeth, supposedly. Claws and teeth of predatory animals worn for protection, specifically against witchcraft, is very common. So wearing a bear claw or um, coyote teeth, things like that. The idea being that the quality of these teeth and claws will bite and scratch and bruise um, And there's an elk knuckle here um, that was very interesting. I hadn't heard this before I encountered it, and I haven't heard it since, so I don't know if it's actually very common. But the person that gave me the elk knuckle, he was a carpenter. And he said that when he was younger, he had really bad arthritis in his hands pretty early on. It was affecting carpentry. And this old guy that worked in the cabinet shop where he worked and gave him this elk knuckle to wear and said that if you wear that, it will strengthen your hands. And he wore this until he finally retired. So after that point, he started having trouble with his hands. So he uh, gave it to me. And I, I'm not a carpenter, nor do I have arthritis. So I uh, haven't tried it out. Um, but uh, if you happen to want to experiment with that, um, find yourself an elk in a bowl. Other sort of naturally formed objects that are used as uh, amulets, one of the common ones kind of in the back here is lightning wood, wood from a lightning struck tree. Um, the idea being that, you know, this is auspicious because of the rarity of this situation. And it's also this sort of empowerment from the sky into this tree. And so people would collect the wood. And I still know people that collect it. I'm one of the people that's watching the tree. Uh, but people would collect it for all different kinds of purposes. I, I've encountered people who, uh, one guy said his dad used to carve lightning wood into two picks. Um, the idea being that it was supposed to help with toothache. So if you have an inky tooth, to use a toothpick from a lightning struck tree, uh, specifically oak, if you can find it, um, that is supposed to be the most auspicious. Um, but also, people would scatter it around the house to protect against witchcraft or protect from illnesses that tried to come into the house. People would wear them as sort of ward against illnesses, things like that. Um, ginseng roots. Uh, ginseng used to be a lot more common here in the Ozarks. It's not uh, as common anymore. I think people are trying to get it started again. It's almost over harvested. But ginseng roots are shaped like people. Uh, they have like little legs and little arms sometimes. And so ginseng was used as a medicine, very medicinal plant, but also healers would sometimes use these as little represented, representations of their patients. Um, so we have the connotation of sticking the pens and the doll against your enemies. But this was a sort of form of ritual work that was also used by healers to be able to heal their patients without having to be in the same place. And so it was pretty common for people to make little dolls of their patients and then, you know, put medicinal plants with them or pray over them, uh, things like that. Just shaped like the person. That's one of the sort of natural problems, natural problems. And then honey locust thorn. Uh, honey locust, if you know that honey locust tree, make these big thorn clusters. And so this is another idea of sympathy. These thorns look like little spears and little swords, and they're very sharp. So we can take these and we can put them in you know, bags and keep them in the house, and maybe they'll protect us. Maybe they'll act as swords or spears. Like that, uh, that actually help the family from whatever it might be. 
Um, the dowsing rod that we've got here, that's talking about plants. Uh, so dowsing, of course, you could douse for water, you could douse for buried treasure, douse for petroleum if you're in Texas, uh, natural gas, uh, all sorts of stuff. But there were preferred plants in the Ozarks that were used for douse for drinking. And also healers douse as well. Um, it's actually pretty common for healers to have some form of dowsing that was part of their diagnosis process. Um, so in the case of this form of dowsing, where you use a rod, um, if you know the idea behind dowsing, basically for a white tape rod, you'll hold the rod and it'll dip down on its own whenever you're near whatever you're looking for. So if it's water, it'll dip down if it's water. Well, healers would do this to find where illnesses were rooted in the body. Uh, because in Ozark traditional healing theory, where an illness's symptoms are isn't necessarily always where the illness is rooted. So you might have symptoms of a chest cold or a fever, but the illness might actually be living somewhere else in the body. And so dowsing is kind of an important way of locating that. Also using things like pendulums or dowsing. Um, pendulum being sort of a weight attached to a string, and whole stones or whole objects were used for this purpose a lot. Not only were they very auspicious, but you could easily tie a string to the hole and then you know put it over the person where it turned a certain way or moved a certain way, it might be where the illness is, or it might be an answer to their question. And if you're thinking all of this sort of sounds spooky, I want to reiterate that, you know, the use of things like pendulums, things like that, we have a very specific connotation for these things today. Um, but all of this would have been a part of a natural science for Ozarkers. Uh, I have never met uh, an Ozark healer who referred to any of this as that. It was just, again, which, um, and so the idea of, of dowsing and influence like that as a form of divination did happen. People looked at that quite a bit. Uh, one of the most popular pendulums for divining the future, specifically for divining your future spouse, was to take a Bible and tie a string through the spine of it and let it hang. And that would answer your questions a bit more term. But for healers, this was not a form of magic. This was uh, the universe or nature or God acting through the doctrine of the And so, you know, dowsing, if you, if you know any water dowsers, none of them will ever say that this is magic. It, it all has to do with you know, the magnetic pull between the person and the earth, things like that. The same thing with healers. Um, the he a healer might use a, a ritual or use an object, an auspicious object, uh, as a part of a healing process because that object contains natural power, uh, not necessarily because it is uh, inherent. So I think language is very important to address, especially when we start talking about stuff like this. Um, we refer to things today uh, in specific ways that old timers might not have. So there are also a whole host of repurposed objects, repurposed from within the house itself. Um, Ozark folk magic is very simple. The folk healing processes are very simple, uh, but not simplistic, which means that on the outside, these things seem very simple, appear very simple, but underneath, the healers are often doing a lot of mental work, they're, you know, they're, they're working out like the auspicious moon phases and things, the best time to heal certain things. So there's a lot of work behind the scenes, but what you might see is, you know, somebody just praying over something, somebody making medicine. And so if you, if you aren't paying attention, you might not even catch the healing process at all, um, which I think is a, a very beautiful part of those are healing tradition, that it is a showy um, it's really based within the sort of internal gift of the healer and how they are able to then bring that into the community. And so a lot of the, the work of the healer is sort of behind the scenes. Um, this work 
you know, and traditionally it was based on you know, what you could gather from the land, what you could grow, and what you could repurpose. So repurposing from the house involved things like liquid medicines that were sometimes then blessed by a healer or used in ways that maybe doctors wouldn't have been did. Uh, one of the my favorite um, anecdotes that Vance Randolph collected was he met the family that um, they always treated, you know, if somebody got shot, they would treat the bullet as well as the wound. Um, and so this idea of uh, put some of the medicine on the bullet or on the knife blade yourself, um, as well as on the wound. It's just sort of the sympathetic connection between the object and the that's harmed by the object. So repurposing of liquid medicines that you get in the pharmacy is very common. Uh, to the extent where you have these companies now, like a thousand ways to use it, that sort of thing. Uh, if you could only afford certain medicines, how cool it is, you would use those medicines for everything, even if it wasn't necessarily what it was intended for. Um, speaking of VIX, I, I met a guy who used VIX for everything, but um, specifically he said that if you, you think that somebody like, has put a person trying to curse you, specifically like an enemy or something like that, um, you can take a cotton ball with some VIX on it, and then you carry that or wear that when you are going to talk to the person, um, and it is supposed to break the curse. So we can even have liquid medicine used as an anti-witchcraft, sort of ritual effects like that, protective wards. Repurposing also extends to, you know, metals, things like that. There's an, uh, an assortment of coffin nails here, uh, which I can confirm came from coffins, but I did not take them from any coffins. Uh, so coffin nails, you know, we have, maybe initially this idea of death, you know, associations with death. But death for a lot of those art healers specifically was just a way, a, a sort of natural form of auspiciousness. So there was nothing necessarily spooky or, uh, you know, witchy about death. The nails that you pry out of the coffin secretly uh, are powerful objects because they had come in contact with it's just like repurposing uh, needles that sew the death shroud or pieces from the death shroud itself. Um, these things would be carried as protective objects. Nails like this could be used as part of healing ritual. Um, so no association with death, but association with that sort of auspiciousness. Uh, but that, that said, they can also be used in <laughs> rituals for death and things like that. Metals like copper, so there's a copper bracelet here, there's a silver dime. Uh, so a silver dime at one point was as lucky of an object that Buckeye not to carry. Uh, silver you know, has sort of long associations in the Ozarks with the full moon. So there's a, a mini ritual you all can perform on the next full moon for luck, prosperity, and money in your pockets. You get a silver dime, and it has to be real silver, I'm sorry, a lot of stuff. It's gotta be, it's gotta be the old style dimes that are silver, but you put it in your right pocket and on the next full moon, you go outside and you look at the moon and you turn it over three times in your pocket. And then you turn around and go back to the house. And you'll have good luck for the next month until the next full moon. And so these things could also be used as a part of the healing process too. Um, I have seen teas and medicines made um, and then silver dimes dropped in. Um, while, during the blessing process, or even you know, while it's sitting, the idea that the silver is one of the parts of auspiciousness to the actual medicine itself. Uh, copper bracelets, copper, you know, there's this uh, sort of old, old remedy that copper can draw out in, in like poisons and uh, uh, toxins and things from the body. Um, so copper would be worn specifically, and, and he always a lot of times made their patients wear copper of some sort. Uh, Van Randolph had a good anecdote uh, in his book um, about how when telephone lines came into the rural areas of the Ozarks, they couldn't keep the telephone lines up because the, the Ozarks would go out and strip all the copper out and wear. Um, at that time, they weren't selling it. These days, they weren't selling it. Uh, but then the, the country doctor was figuring it out because all of his patients were coming with copper wire wrapped around their 
their wrist and ankle um, began to sort of protect a ward against bullets. I don't have any of it in the case, but at the fetida root, anybody's heard at the fetida or at the fetidae root, um, is a very pungent smelling root. It smells to raw onions and garlic. Um, and so this was a, a pharmaceutical product that farmers would carry, and both our group would bag it up and wear it, or they would most often make the kids wear it to protect against illnesses. And this is a very, very old theory. We're talking going back to like Greek medicine, um, the theory that pungent odors or strong odors have the ability to disperse germs or the sort of uh, cloud of sickness that's around us all times. And so strong smells were used a lot, camphor resin, very pungent sort of eucalyptus smell, sulfur powder, acetaminophen powder, all these things were used as a way of sort of warding off illnesses. And I mean, it probably worked because I bet nobody would get close to you. Um, that's my theory of why it worked. Uh, but I have I have interviewed quite a few old timers who had just horrible memories of being a kid going to school and like trying to have, hide the asset in a bag with everybody new because you stink. Uh, but it's not not so common anymore. <laughs> Um, there, there are just to uh, mention a couple other items here, you know, there's pawpaw sleeve, pawpaws have an association, the pawpaw fruit has an association with ghosts, specifically. Um, so there's a, a really, really old tradition that was recorded by a few different folklorists. I've never encountered it myself, um, but it, it is in, in the record of burying people with pawpaw in their hand. Um, to make sure that they don't come back as a ghost to haunt you. Um, I think it's an idea that's connected to this idea of nourishment. Uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables are used as a part of prosperity, sort of stuff like that, or with spirits. This idea that if you're feeding them, they're going to be nourished, they aren't going to bother you. Um, so there's pop policy there. But you know, this is just a small sampling of you know, what all is out there. Um, there are a ton of other remedies and rituals and things like that that aren't represented here. And all of it is a sort of connection to nature itself, and connection to what is in the home. And so the, the, the power of the healer was limited only to their creativity, to their, their cunningness, to their ability to be able to look in the natural world and find things that could heal or look around their home and find that get people together. Um, so there are a lot of, you know, we mentioned brooms, but axes have their purpose, knives have their purpose. Um, I always tell people, I, 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 at some point in the future, I'm going to write a book just about string, uh, because string is uh, the Ozark's favorite healing tool. You can do all sorts of things with it uh, in the healing process as well as supporting your decision. So, Really, I think you know the heart. You know this whole exhibit is the Ozark home, uh, and so the heart of Ozark community, Ozark life, is the home. So many of our remedies and things that I've collected and things that have been passed down are based in family traditions. So families differ from families, and so I always tell people if you want to get a good sense of Ozark folk practice, you got to talk to a lot of people. Uh, because there is no one way to describe Ozark folk practice. There is no one way to do any of this. Um, it is all based in the traditions that are family to family, how those past that. And so that, that's the, real, the heart of all of this this idea of connection, home, and this connection. Using what you got, repurposing, and that deep connection with the land that's around us. The land as a provider, just like our home sort of provider for us. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I think that there's a lot of information there. And I kind of want to leave some time for questions. Maybe. Um, how's the chat doing? So we have a hello from Saskatchewan, oh. Canada. And then one of our participants online does have a buckeye in her purse. <laughs> I recommend everyone go out and get a buckeye. <laughs> You gotta find them though. You kind of can't find them. That, uh, that's Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. <laughs>